Craig Kulikowski is our veterinarian, and he's um, not only a great vet, but he's also very anti-horse slaughter, which is the way we feel all vets should be, but not everyone is as willing to speak out as he is. And when I asked him to, to speak uh, at this summit, um, we talked about what he would talk about, and one of the things that came up was ethics what the modern vet, the ethics of the modern vet was his title. And that's a fascinating topic that he's going to explore. So, Dr. Kulikowski. All right, thank you very much, Susan. Um, thanks for inviting me again to come speak. Uh, thanks for everyone that's come this weekend uh, to audit or to speak. It's been a pretty incredible group of people um, that brought a lot of good evidence uh, with them. Um, of course, what I'm going to present is the most important thing, so uh, <laughs> just sit tight. Um, but um, we, I practice half the year up here and half the year in Florida. Um, my uh, practice consists of uh, four different people. Um, I put this slide up because um, that's each one of the people in my practice um, on a horse because we're all horsemen and in that group of four people we have over a hundred years of horsemanship experience so we're all horsemen first and then veterinarians and I think that makes a really big difference when it comes to the profession they almost teach you in school to, tr to try not to be emotional about being a doctor you know and uh, I think what I found is that there's a real significant difference between the doctors that care and the doctors that don't and um, I don't think you can remove that emotion successfully and still have the same level of care. Um, so we believe that it's important and we, we believe in being horsemen um, first. So I was going to talk about horse slaughter and the modern veterinarian's ethical role. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off with the veterinarian's oath. I talked about this last year, so for those that were uh, here last year, it may seem a little repetitive, but it changes after the first few slides. Um, but in 1969, the veterinarian's oath um, was, was this, and it, so it says, being admitted to the profession of veterinary medicine, I solemnly dedicate myself and the knowledge I possess to the benefit of society, to the, the conservation of our livestock resources, and to the relief of suffering of animals. I will practice my profession conscientiously with dignity, the health of my patients, the best interest of their owners, and the welfare of my fellow man uh, will be my primary considerations. I will at all times be humane and temper pain with, with anesthesia where indicated. Um, I will not use my knowledge contrary to the laws of humanity nor in contravention to the ethical code of my profession. I will uphold and strive to advance the honor and the noble traditions of the veterinary profession these pledges I make freely in the eyes of God and upon my honor. A couple things that I noticed when I was reading through these different O's, there's several different O's that, um, that have changed over time, that uh, benefit of society ranked first. It was one of the first things that came up in this oath. Um, conservation of livestock was second. Uh, then we got to relief of suffering, the end. Um, it talks about the best interest of the owner, um, and it's very strongly biased for the human benefit, I thought this pledge was. Um, welfare of fellow man. It doesn't mention the welfare of animals, which I thought was interesting. And then temper pa pain when indicated. Um, you know, at what point would, you know, trying to, to cure pain, when wouldn't it be indicated? I thought that was sort of an odd phrasing. Um, so the oath was altered in 1999, and it read, being admitted to the profession of veterinary medicine, I solemnly swear to use my scientific knowledge and skills for the benefit of society through the protection of animal health, the relief of animal suffering, the conservation of livestock resources, the promotion of public health, and the advancement of medical knowledge. I will practice my profession conscientiously with dignity and keeping with the principles of veterinary medical ethics. I accept as a lifelong obligation, the continual improvement of my profession, knowledge, and competence. So on this, on this 1999's oath, um, 
the benefit of society um, through the protection of animal health, that was a little bit different than the first oath. Um, the oath recognizes that the society will benefit when the animals benefit. I thought that was important. Uh, number two, the protection of animal health and relief of suffering now second in the list um, in front of conservation of livestock. So it's sort of changing the position um, of, of the way we view the animal as not just livestock. <clears throat> And then conservation of livestock and promotion of public health is listed last. Um, you know, and what, that was what I was saying is the role of companion animals um, is, is developing, okay? And, and that's not that long ago, 1999, as far as I'm concerned. So again, the Veterans Oath changed in uh, 2010. It got a little, sh a little shorter. Um, and it says, being admitted to the profession of veterinary medicine, I solemnly swear to use my scientific knowledge and skills for the benefit of society through the protection of animal health and welfare, the prevention and relief of animal suffering, the conservation of animal resources, the promotion of public health, and the advancement of medical knowledge. So in this one, it gets better, it keeps getting better, which I think is a good sign. Um, number one, now protecting society through the protection of animal health and welfare with the prevention and relief of suffering. It's the first time that welfare and prevention is employed in the oath, okay? Um, this reflects the acknowledgement of rights that animals have, have earned in society. And it totally dropped the mention of livestock, um, a clear departure from the past oaths, and that erases the line between companion animals and livestock. There's no distinction of their rights. I thought that was interesting too. So, you know, horse slaughter is not ethical in my opinion, and I'm going to go into why I don't think so. Um, and, it, and it violates the veterinarian's oath, you know, at least in a couple of ways. In no way, in my opinion, is it protecting animal health, okay? The end result is, is their death. Um, and it's not promoting public health. For sure, and we'll really get into that because I think whether that's the most important thing to me or not it doesn't matter. But it's it's the part I can sell, and it's the part I can prove, and it's the part that I can take to legislators and say, "You have to be looking out for people for this reason." Okay. I mean, protecting animal health—that's what I care the most about. But but that doesn't always change people's opinions. Okay, so horse slaughter is not ethical. There are many reasons from the medical standpoint. So I talked about this last year. Slaughter bypasses any medical intervention of diseased or injured horses. So what it means is someone can decide that their horse is not healthy anymore. And they may have no medical training, no medical background, and they make the decision that they're going to take that horse to auction. That horse goes to auction and then goes to slaughter. So it could end up going to slaughter or being killed without ever having medical intervention, without ever having an exam, you know? The horse may have a very treatable problem, but the owner doesn't know that, okay? So it totally bypasses any sort of health care, and that I have a problem with as, as far as, as being a doctor. Um, this I'm going to talk a lot about. The meat resulting from the slaughter is tainted on many levels, okay? Um, and then, if you were to find tainted um, meat, there's no tracking or tracing of the tainted meat to intervene on its origin. So in other words, you have no idea where this tainted meat came from. There's no way of going back to find out, you know, what farm produced this horse that has butte in it? What farm produced this horse that has antibiotics in it? There's no way to find out where that horse goes, especially in this country where there's no passport system. And in Europe they have a passport system for horses, but it's, it's still, with a lot of this stuff, it's on the honor system which, if it was entrusted to the horses, I, I would trust it. But since it's entrusted in the humans, I have very little faith. And so finally, the, and the most obvious to us, is how can the ruthless ending of animals' life be coupled with the protection of its health? So this one is going to be a little video, and um, it, it's a little bit um, graphic. But I think there are people here that probably haven't seen this. Oh. That haven't seen these before. And this is just one of the ones that I found. Um, that I thought, for anyone who, anyone who hasn't actually seen a video before of, the, of, of one way of horses being slaughtered, 
this is a, 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 a good thing to see. Maybe we can maximize it. Okay. So in this case, they were using a 22 rifle, and those who are familiar with, with rifles, a 22 is a quite small caliber rifle. It's a small bullet. They use it to render a horse insensible. I'll just let you read this. So that was just part one of three. I'm not going to show the rest. I think you know we've seen enough there. Um, we could just go back to the slide. I wanted to show that for a couple reasons. One is there are probably people that haven't seen that you know a video like that, um, and that's considered one of the um, humane ways of killing a horse is, is by bullet. Okay, and so you know I, I would happily argue with any person, any veterinarian. Um, that that doesn't look very humane to me, you know. And I kept, when I was watching this video, I was wondering what kind of person can stand there and do that over and over again. But it made sense, Paul, when you brought up your graph of the way that violence dropped in Kaufman when, when the slaughter plant left. To me, that has to be a person that is on some level a violent person, you know, some, some level not, not a healthy individual. So... So how does the ethical veterinarian divert horses from slaughter and help provide this protection of animal health and welfare and the prevention and relief of animal suffering? Okay, so one of the ways of diverting horses from slaughter is to talk about the, the overpopulation problem. Um, the overpopulation problem of dogs and cats has been recognized for many years and is, and is well known. You know, um, there's been a lot of focus on the responsible spaying and neutering of, of small companion animals. 
those small companion animal populations is out of control because of the inherent drive to reproduce, the short gestation period, meaning it takes about two months to make new puppies or kittens, and the regular birth of litters, multiple siblings, so cats and dogs, they have more than one um, at a time when they birth. So that creates a, a really large volume. So what about the equine population? Most male horses in this country get, get castrated, the majority of them for sure. They have a very long gestation period. It takes 11 months to make a foal. And at the end of that, you rarely have successful multiple births. So you have one foal at the most, generally. I mean, occasionally you'll get twins, but oftentimes one of the twins doesn't survive, okay? So why is there an equine overpopulation problem? Does it make sense, right? Well, it does make sense because humans keep breeding them. This is an entirely man-made problem, okay? We're doing this, okay? It's not like they're out there breeding and just making foals and they're all over the place. We're actively doing this, okay? Humans are generating more horses than homes exist for them or that people want to have homes for them. So what's the veterinarian's role in this? Well, I think it's a couple, um, but part of it is client education, you know, so before these veterinarians go out and help people breed more horses, they, or assist in the reproduction process, they need to discuss the costs and the risks of breeding, and also highlight the presence of the population that already exists. I mean, does, do we need another horse? Just because you have a mare in your backyard, does it mean we should be breeding that mare? and also educating organizations um, and addressing the equine organizations that encourage and support the breeding programs, such as the thoroughbreds, the standard breds, and the quarter horses. One of the things that came up yesterday um, that I was hoping Dr. Hogan would talk about was that there's actual funds that go to these breeding organizations to make more horses, you know, from the racing, you know, and yet there's no funds that are go being diverted to help with retirement plans for these, these animals. So they're actively encouraging population growth and then wondering why it's a problem, right? And, and as veterinarians, this is, a, this is an issue because there are veterinarians that almost make their entire living out of breeding horses. And so for organizations like the AAP, for instance, which I'll talk about in a second, there are, there's a real conflict of interest there. You know, well, I, I, must, I, I could be a theriogenologist, which would mean I'm a board-certified specialist in breeding horses. You're going to tell me that I should be consulting people on not to breed their horses? It, so that conflict of interest exists. So we need to encourage the discussion among professionals regarding the organization's positions on animal reproduction. And I don't think that's occurring at this point. Um, at last year's University of Albany, New York Racing and Wagering Conference that I attended, um, I discussed the need for racing organizations to include their, in their registration process funds for placing horses after their racing career is over. There's this thing called the New York Task Force for Retired Racehorses that was developed, and that task force estimated that it takes $2,400 to place a thoroughbred after its racing career is over. So collecting this fee at the time of registering those horses would not only reduce haphazard breeding, but would start the funding of the retirement program necessary for these horses. So if every time they bred or bred a racehorse, before they could register it, they had to put this money into that social security for horses that was talked about yesterday, we would actually end up with, with some funds to help place these horses. Now, I don't think $2,400 is, is enough. Anyone here who owns a horse knows that you can go through $2,400 very, very quickly. But it is a start, okay? At least we have some acknowledgement that we need to be putting some funds in this direction, okay? Another situation the veterinarian can assist in decreasing the number of horses headed for slaughter is by help, helping preserve their health during training. So while the horses are alive and competitive and racing or showing or whatever it might be. The veterinarians need to be, to be more open and honest about identifying horses that are at risk for injury. Meaning, if you do an exam on a horse and you have concerns as a veterinarian that it may 
get injured during its next race, then your 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 role in, in the oath that you supposedly took should be to say something to that trainer who should say something to that owner that says that we need to, to take a break here. We need to give this horse a rest. We need to give it a chance to get better before we move on. The veterinarians need to realize that they are the gatekeeper of these horses' health. It is not the trainer or the owner that should be making these medical decisions, okay? By identifying horses at risk, there will be less chance for catastrophic injury. Horses that can be identified and placed before they sustain a career-ending injury at least have a chance. Once a horse sustains a catastrophic injury, their chances for placement are slim to non-existent. Once a horse is hurt and can't be ridden, it's less desirable to people because people have horses generally to ride them. So when the veterinarian is constantly treating these horses with pain masking medications, the buttes, the banamines, the ketophins, the arquils, whatever it is, it puts the horses and humans at risk. And when I say humans, I mean you ask a jockey that's ridden a horse that broke down, they've watched their life pass before their eyes while they get trampled nearly by the eight horses behind them or beside them. Okay, so it's not just horses that are at risk in these situations but it is humans too. Um, in a letter to the New York racing regulators, there's a, there's a veterinarian named Dr. James Hunt, a, a very well-known uh, veterinarian, by the way, um, said that trainers should not have to regularly reveal their medication regimens. In other words, there should be some sort of confidentiality that they should need to be reporting to people about what kind of medications their horses are on. Okay, And yeah, there are... There are some confidentiality issues, but on a situation where this is ra racing and wagering, I don't know why there should be confidentiality issues. People are betting on these horses, so why are we keeping secrets about the medications they're on? And this is in quotations, the trainers are the real clients, not the owners, Dr. Hunt added. The board must also understand that the trainers make nearly 100% of all veterinary decisions regarding the medication of their horses. So does anyone else see the problem here? You know, so there's a real conflict of interest for that trainer. If he's the one that, or she is the one that's, that's making the decisions about these horses, but is also the one who gets paid to keep these horses in training, gets paid to win races, then they shouldn't be the ones making medical decisions about them because they'll make decisions that are based on their paycheck first. And additionally, of course, they don't possess the medical training to make informed decisions, okay? But they have this conflict of interest I just talked about. So the veterinarians like Dr. Hunt need to be challenged on their ethics. You know, just because he's been around for 100 years and, <laughs> and has all the good clients doesn't mean that we shouldn't raise our voices. And, and Dr. Hogan talked about yesterday how she got a lot of pushback after she went to Congress and talked about you know, anti-slaughter issues. There were uh, members of AEP and other people in the profession that blackballed her. You know? So it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but I think, it's, I think it's necessary for veterinarians to, when they can, and get the opportunity like this, to say something and say we don't agree with that. Um, I think it goes a long way. Um, we need to, uh, these, these individuals like Dr. Hunt need to be challenged by the media and the state board and other veterinarians. State board meaning, you know, the board of, the board of, uh, of veterinary medicine, you know, should be asking questions like, why would the owners be making medical decisions? You know, that doesn't seem like a really big leap um, that a state board might be curious about that. I would have preferred that Dr. Hunt mention the rights of his patients and their responsibilities to the horses, but I didn't find that. Instead, he shirks his responsibilities as a veterinarian and hands that over to that authority to his trainers, you know, that help line his pockets. So instead of masking these injuries all the time with medications and injections and anything else that they come up with that year, snake venom, frog juice, whatever might be out there, you know, the veterinarian's the one that should be safeguarding the horse from injury. 
You know, the veterinarians know that these two-year-old horses are immature mentally and physically. They're prone to get hurt, okay? We need to be able to recognize that they're going to need a break. They're going to need a chance to get better. Maybe two-year-old is too young to start doing this stuff, right? Yeah. Right. When are we going to talk about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. These veterinarians need to be the ones encouraging the rest, the resting of injuries and the delaying of racing until these horses are mature enough to handle the strains of training and racing. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of picking on racing, but this can be applied to any of the horse sports. I could show you examples in any single one of them, including the ones that I do, where people push the envelope or call it abuse. They abuse their horses to get the results that they want or need for financial gain. I, I stole a couple of slides from John okay. here. Is that okay? <laughs> I, I never remember to ask for permission, but um, <laughs> he hasn't complained yet. So this is one of John Holland's slides, these next two. And the, the, this idea of delaying racing um, or by increasing the length of time that a horse is racing, what it ends up doing is this graph shows the number of horse years that you have to provide care for these racehorses once they've stopped racing. So if you increase the amount of time that they actually are in training and in racing, then you reduce the number of horse years of care. So in the last slide, it was 273,000 horse years without care. And by just moving a little bit the amount of time for, for racing and training, longer, past five years, it reduced it down to 209,000 years of, uh, of horses without care. So it's still a lot of years that we have to take care of these horses, but it reduced it by almost a third, right? So that's, that makes a big difference by prolonging this horse's careers. Now, if these were show horses, we'd probably start at about four or five, and they'd show to somewhere between 15 and 20. And so that's where these guys fall in. You know, that's where a lot of these get, they pick up these horses, hopefully, okay? But the idea is the more time they spend in here or here, the less time they are up here where they don't have care anymore. And these are the horses that, you know, are left out in the field, not getting their vaccinations, not getting their care, or they end up getting sent to slaughter, okay? So we need to keep shrinking this little section up here. Is that pretty much what that says? Okay, good. But we're not going to I don't know about that. So, what happens when the horses do sustain a catastrophic injury, when they break down, or they have a threatening, life-threatening medical condition? And we've been talking about this this weekend a little bit. Veterinarians need to make the end-of-life decisions like euthanasia affordable, okay? Euthanasia is not the time for veterinarians to be adding to their retirement accounts. <laughs> and I'm not asking that veterinarians work for free, but something tells me Dr. Hunt can afford to put a horse to sleep pretty close to cost. I'm, pr I'm quite sure of that. Yeah. Yeah. By keeping euthanasia affordable, veterinarians will be able to divert some of the horses going to slaughter towards a, a more humane end-of-life situation, okay? I talked about this yesterday. And so, after I brought it up, I, I, I looked it, into it a little bit further. This Controlled Substance Act actually has been in place for a long time, but they've just started enforcing it in certain locations. So there were some veterinarians out west, like in California, and in, um, I think, Washington State, um, where they basically started saying that you can't carry these controlled substances on your vehicle they have to stay in, in the clinic that's registered to those medications. And those are, the, those are the drugs that have high potential for abuse, like the morphine, the Oxycontin. But the euthanasia solution is a controlled substance. Now, people don't abuse it, so it's, it's almost weird that it's in the controlled substance category, but it is. And so if they start, and so what, what I was getting emails about and what I was seeing on Facebook was, that there's actually a, a, a movement right now to, to amend the law. And so that, that's what we need support with, is getting the amendment in there so that veterinarians aren't going to get prosecuted for having these, these medications on their vehicle so they can euthanize horses on the farm, you know, at a place where a horse has broken a leg. It doesn't have to get stuck on a horse trailer and brought somewhere else only to be put to sleep, or that horse that's colicking so violently that you can't get it on a trailer. 
you know, any of those situations, it, it would protect the veterinarians from being uh, prosecuted by the DEA, basically. So we can also identify veterinarians uh, in the organizations. Um, modern veterinarians can help identify other veterinarians, like Dr. Hunt, for instance, that are behind the curve when it comes to animals' health and welfare. Remind them of what their job is supposed to be, um, not just what they're doing. We can identify organizations like the AEP, which is the American Association for Equine Practitioners, or the Farm Bureau that might be catering to the members' economic welfare more than the animals' welfare. So if these big organizations that are somehow related to animals are making decisions based entirely on the economic effect it will have on their members, then it's not going to help the welfare of the animal that's involved. Okay? I've been on the New York, I have a little bit of a pet peeve with the Farm Bureau, and I've been on their website many times and have yet to identify one statement resembling the concern for farm animals from which its members make a living. I keep looking for something in their mission statement or something that says, oh yeah, by the way, we, we care about these animals that make our living for us. And I thought it was interesting, I added this slide last night with uh, Buster's Law when, um, I guess it was Assemblyman Tedesco was, was talking about uh, his work on that. And I, I say it was no surprise, but it kind of was a surprise. I, I didn't know it anyway, that, that the Farm Bureau was pushing back against Buster's Law because they were, they were concerned about how that might affect farmers and the way they can deal with their animals. So when an agriculture organization stalls the efforts of protecting animal welfare, we can be sure their interests are solely economic, okay? And we need to start saying this out loud, you know, so that people hear it and they have to respond and like defend that position. Like, how do you defend that position, right? I mean, maybe they have one, but let me hear it. Then we can have an argument. <laughs> um, once we start to draw attention to these veterinarians and these organizations' backwards positions, then the public can bring pressure and influence on those public positions, okay? Like the people that we've had this weekend. It's been amazing, the number of politicians that I like now that I didn't know before, you know? And so that's good news, I think. Silently accepting these positions because they are influential veterinarians or organization only enables them further. In other words, if we do nothing, they feel like we agree. Most owners are unaware of what medic. Okay, so what else can veterinarians do to educate their owners? Um, most owners are not aware of the medications that go into their horse's body and what effects those medications might have on a human being. Um, well, we've talked about Butte a lot, and that was a great presentation yesterday on Butte. And it was, that was a lot of work that went into that, that presentation that Dr. Marini did um, to get something published like that is, uh, you know, for instance, I have no published work. So she spent a lot of time doing that. And for people that are in academia and publishing is, is you know, is quite a feather in their cap. So it's a great tool piece of information to use for us, especially when we're going to talk to legislators about this stuff. But the Butte is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? So it's great to have that tool, but now we can talk about all the other drugs that horses are on um, that, that could be in their system. What are approved drugs? Okay, so as far as the FDA is concerned, an approved drug is any medication um, that has gone through their uh, approval process. So they basically have to jump through a ton of hoops for a medication to be legal to sell for human use, okay? Um, but even those approved drugs have side effects, okay? And everyone knows someone with an allergy, and any given human can have an allergy to any given drug, whether it is approved or not. I mean, it can go through this whole jumping through hoops process, but that humans can still have a reaction to those drugs, okay? It can be approved and in, in quote unquote safe, but it can also cause a problem to any particular individual that would have an allergy to it. And that's why when you watch those drug commercials on TV, they always have that disclaimer. If you experience any of these side effects, stop using the medication immediately and call your doctor. Why do they say that? Because in the studies that they did, they have a whole list of side effects, whether it's nausea or vomiting or diarrhea or whatever it might be. There is a group of individuals that got studied that had side effects from these drugs, okay? 
But what about these drugs? Not to be used in animals intended for slaughter. So these are drugs that are not approved at all for use in humans, okay? There are no safety studies, and there may be actually there may actually be data indicating that the drugs are known to be harmful to humans. So not only are they not approved for human use, but it may be known that they're actually bad for humans, and that's why they're not to be used in, in uh, animals intended for slaughter. So these drugs, if they if they're used in animals, they may end up at slaughter. And so basically, we're using the public as experimental specimens to see what side effects you might experience, okay? It, and in any event, any drug that ends up in, a, in meat and then ends up in a human is an unintentional drug, okay? The bottom line is that no person or animal should be exposed to a drug that has not been prescribed to them by a doctor. None of us would take a drug for no reason. You know, we, we all, we may be, may be on medications, but hopefully we were put on them, you know, for, by, after an exam by a doctor, and there's a good reason to be on these drugs. And even when they've been prescribed, it needs to be used with caution and constant monitoring. In other words, if, even if they put you on a medication, they still want to know, is this the right dose? Is this too much? Is it too little? Are you having side effects from it? And these are drugs that are prescribed to you. You're supposed to be taking. So we're talking about drugs that were never prescribed, you're not supposed to be taking, may not even be for useful in humans, or maybe even be dangerous to humans. So one of the, one of the categories would be anabolic steroids. Um, they're commonly used to bolster young horses in training or support geriatric patients that are having trouble maintaining health. The, F, the FEI, the Federation Equestrian International, it's a, the, it's a governing body for all Olympic horse sports, basically. Um, they can test for anabolic steroids at least for 90 days after an administration. So this means that the steroid is circulating in the bloodstream at a high enough level for 90 days after an intermuscular dose. So how much steroid is in that muscle, fat, or kidney? So if I gave an anabolic steroid to a horse, if I walked up to it 90 days later and drew blood out of its vein, there would still be steroid in the blood. Not to mention all the other places. It will be in muscle longer, fat longer, and it will be in, in kidney probably the longest. Okay? So if just giving one injection can last in the bloodstream for 90 days, God knows what its levels are in the, in the meat. So the answer is no one knows how long it would be there because we don't do studies on that. We haven't been testing for that. I mean, the FEI knows because they're trying to control competition, but they're not doing it to find out when we can eat horse meat. So they stopped at this point and said, okay, well, maybe after 90 days we can't find it in the bloodstream anymore, but no one's done studies beyond that in horses that I'm aware of. And so some of the common steroid side effects include um, dangerous changes to the left ventricle of the heart, liver damage, high blood pressure, harmful changes to cholesterol, and hormonal changes. And, there's, and the list is probably even much longer than that. And there's a very good chance that a racehorse in training or a geriatric horse received this drug potentially prior to going to auction. Okay, So there's a, there's a decent chance that a horse going to auction may have had a steroid at one point, an anabolic steroid. And then we have things called uh, hor um, hormones. One of them, and they talked about this a little bit yesterday, was Regimate, Alternagest, um, and Medroxyprogesterone. It's another hormone, and they're, um, they're commonly used in mares to help control their estrus cycle. Um, and we use them to keep mares from coming into, into heat during competition or to help regulate their cycle for breeding purposes. In other words, we want them to, to cycle on a specific point so that we can breed them successfully. But how long do those drugs stay in a horse's system? As far as I know, there really aren't any studies that exist to demonstrate the presence in muscle or fat. But I do know that injections of this medroxyprogesterone are usually given once every 21 days to control a mare's cycle, because that's the length of a mare's cycle, okay? So it's, it must be effective for at least three weeks. And I forget who presented yesterday the, 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 about the time a horse could go uh, from racing into slaughter, but the, there was a statement that said it was a uh, 0.25 months, a quarter of a month, a week. 
Okay, so a horse could be racing and then a week later be at, a, at slaughter. Okay, so an injection that was given that lasts 21 days would still clearly be in that horse's system. This is the regime. Make sure you wear your gloves because this is the, let's see, this is the warning label that reads, okay, warning, skin contact must be avoided as ultrasyn, which is the generic regime, is readily absorbed through unbroken skin, okay? Protective gloves must be worn by all persons handling this product. Pregnant women or women who suspect they are pregnant should not handle it. Women of childbearing age should exercise extreme caution when handling this product. That's if it just touches your skin. Like if it drops onto your hand while you're pouring it into the horse's feed. That's how potent this hormone is, right? If it hits your skin, if you're a woman, it might affect you, okay? It probably would affect a male too, but not in the same way. So if just by touching your skin it can get in your body, are you telling me that if you ate it, it wouldn't have some sort of impact? Okay, what about anti-inflammatories? The non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like bute, flunix and megalamine, which is banamine, have already been discussed, mostly bute. Um, and while bute demonstrates potential carcinogenic effects and bone marrow suppression, neither of those products is approved for use in humans. This of course means that there have been no studies to evaluate its safety in humans or the studies that exist to indicate how much danger there is to humans. And these two products, bute and banamine, are, are probably the most commonly used drugs in horses. Um, they're used on a daily basis on race horses and performance horses to improve their soundness levels, to improve their ability to perform. And banamine is the drug of choice for abdominal pain or colic, okay? And it's likely used on, it, on every horse at some point in its life. This is the, um, this is the container. Uh, flumeglamine, it's flunixin megalamine, it's basically banamine, it's a generic banamine. Residue warning, I thought this was interesting. Um, I, said, I hope you can read this, but it says, cattle must not be slaughtered for human consumption within four days of the last treatment. Milk that has been uh, taken during treatment and for 36 hours after the last treatment must not be used for food. Um, not, in use, not for use in dry dairy cows, a withdrawal period has not been established for this product in pre-ruminating calves. Uh, do not use in calves to be processed for veal and not for use in horses intended for food. And the reason they, they stuck this thing on the end is they haven't done any studies on the horses. They at least did some studies on cows. And I don't know if um, you remember from yesterday, Dr. Marine was talking about that one medication um, per, uh, acted very differently in a rat or was it, was it a rat, um, yeah, no, yeah. Th than in other mammals? Well, that means that you can't assume that, that the same study would, uh, uh, would account for the effects on a horse that it does on a ruminant, and a cow is a ruminant. That's the, it's a, a refers to their digestive tracts, entirely different, okay? So they've done no studies on horses to know how long you should withdraw it. And I, and I, and I would suspect that most farmers have a bigger buffer than what's recommended on this label because a dairy farmer do, can't, doesn't want a positive in their milk. What about tranquilizers? We haven't even talked about that. We have xylazine, detonine, torbagesic. They're all common sedatives that most horses receive multiple times in their life. Um, torbagesic is a controlled substance um, because of its abuse of addictive potential. And uh, the controlled uh, drugs are a class of drug like morphine, oxycontin, um, and other powerful medications. Xylazine and detomidine are not used in humans because they are, they are a severe cardiovascular and respiratory suppressant in humans. Doses that we give to the horse, that I would walk out to one of these horses in this field and give, would kill a human. So their horses are, are not very sensitive to these drugs, and humans are very sensitive to these drugs. So even, a, even a, the amount that you would give a normal horse would kill a human. And if that ends up in the horse's meat, well, who knows what those effects could be. Here's Demosedan. This is one of the um, uh, tranquilizers. This is actually one of, as a gel. It's one you can give orally. But again, when you buy this box, they, sell you, they, they also give you these bright blue pair of gloves to wear because they don't want you touching this stuff. They don't want it in contact with your skin, not to mention your digestive tract. 
Here's the warning label. For sublingual use in horses only, do not use in horses intended for human consumption. Human warnings, not for human use. Keep out of reach of children. Use impermeable gloves during drug administration and during procedures that require contact with the horse's mouth, which means that if I gave it and then I went in and did a dental on that horse, I should be wearing gloves too, okay? What about dewormers that we give these horses? Dewormers are also called anthelmetics, and they're, and they're commonly given to horses multiple times a year. And up until recently, where we're doing more fecals to test for worms first before we treat, we used to just deworm horses every other month, every month. At one point, there was a big push on the strongid, which was a daily dewormer. We were giving these horses a dewormer every single day, okay? And there's toxicities to these anthelmetics. If you give too much of it, it will cause problems. Like levamisole, for instance, uh, can cause hypersalivation, muscle tremors, and in a high enough dose, it can cause death. But we don't know what that dose is for humans because we, haven't, we did not necessarily test it for humans. How about Panicure? That's, that's one we all probably used on horses at one point or other. This is actually the power pack. Um, see, uh, the most important thing, just do not use in horses intended for human consumption. That is a very common dewormer. And it's not intended for horses that may go to slaughter. Marquee, it's an uh, antiprotozole. This one didn't come out that great, but I'll read it. Um, for use in animals only, not for use in horses is intended for food, not for human use, keep, keep out of the reach of children. These are drugs that are in my car. I drive around with them all day long. These are, these are drugs that I use on horses every single day. Antibiotics. There, there was that one article that was talking about um, well, we're giving antibiotics to cows and sheep and other sorts of animals, so why is this a big deal? Well, because they're different antibiotics. They're not the same antibiotics, and those have been tested, and those have a withdrawal time. These have no withdrawal time, the ones that we use on horses. Um, and the antibiotics have many side effects, anywhere from just a simple colitis to allergic reactions like penicillin. Everyone's familiar with the reaction to penicillin, the anaphylactic reaction, meaning you die, okay? Um, if you give someone with an allergy an antibiotic that they are allergic to, you risk anaphylaxis and death. If you give antibiotics to a horse and then feed them to a human that is allergic, the consequences could be severe. What, the, what are the consequences? I'm not sure because we, haven't, we don't know. This is a common antibiotic. I use it all the time. It's called Exceed. It's a new one. Well, not, not new, but it's the one if you give it one injection, it's good for four days. So I give the dose to a horse. And I don't have to give another do a dose till four days later. So I know it's circulating in their system for at least that length. And if I give a second dose, that second dose is good for six days. Okay? So I know it's circulating in that horse's system at a therapeutic level, meaning it's working, killing bugs, for at least six days after that second injection. How long is it circulating in that horse's system? Or how long is it in the muscle, the fat, or the kidney? I, I, we don't know. We haven't tested it. This one, I think, has a really interesting label, too. Um, okay, oh yeah, cattle up here, residue warnings. Following label use as a single treatment, a 13-day pre-slaughter withdrawal period is required. Okay, this is cattle. If they give it to a, a cow, it's gotta, you've got to wait 13 days before it can go to slaughter. <laughs> following label use as a single treatment, no milk discard period is required for this product. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, subcutaneous injection in the neck or intermuscular injection may cause um, violative residues. So in other words, if you give this sub-Q or intermuscular in a cow, it will test for longer than 13 days. It'll be present for longer than, th it, it could be. It's saying it, it may cause violative residues, meaning it, you might get a positive on it. A withdrawal period has not been established for this product in pre-ruminating calves. And don't use it in calves for veal. And then, of course, don't use it in humans. Um, it talks about not getting in the skin, the eyes, the mouth. It also has this interesting one. Injection of exceed sterile suspension into arteries of the ears is likely to result in sudden death to an animal. So these are medications that if they get in the wrong spot, it'll kill a cow. 
So what, what would it do to a human? We don't know. What about the drugs that we don't know about? And this is the one that it's probably more disturbing than even in, than the other ones we've just discussed. I was on a, a Naira racetrack last year and I discovered a tooth floater. And I have a, a pet peeve with tooth floaters too, but the, he would... He was working on a, a horse that appeared to be sedated. Um, this is an individual with no medical training whatsoever, appeared to be giving sedatives by intravenous injections, and he told the owner that it was xylazine that he injected. Um, so I drew blood on the horse to figure out what it was that he gave. Was it truly xylazine? How, you know, I couldn't tell how much, but at least make sure that that's in fact what he was, what he was using. I don't know if you can read this, it's quite dark, but it basically is, it's a toxicology report from the university, and it reads, no xylazine detected in plasma. The sample was positive for an unknown compound by GCMS, which is a way they test for things, which had a spectrum matching a sample we had back in 1998 that involved a, a heavily sedated horse that was reported to have been given an unknown tranquilizer from France. So after I submitted this blood work, about three days later, I got this call from Cornell and from the toxicology department. And the guy calls me up and he says, where did you get this blood? And I said, well, I got it off of a horse that someone had supposedly sedated. He, goes, he said, well, we don't know what it is. It doesn't match any of our normal spectrums that we would see, okay? But he said, but it reminded me, and it, this, is, this is a good employee, it reminded me of a case back in 1998 that we saw. So he went back in the file and found, and the, basically when they do this test to see the drug, they're looking for a spike on a, on a graph, basically. And he recognized the spike as something else he had seen 15 years earlier. Okay? So he went back and found this spike and he matched them up and said, this looks like the same exact drug but we still don't know what it is. And so when he, when he got it back in 1998, he was told that the drug came from France. But we don't know what it was, we, we still don't know what it is, and yet it was injected into a horse. And so how many of these type of medications are horses getting that we have absolutely no idea what is in it? And we're gonna, somehow that's gonna end up in our food chain? So horses bound for slaughter, whether they're coming from the racetrack or from prolonged illness, they're likely to have received one or multiple of these drugs within a close proximity to going to auction or slaughter, especially if they're you know, competing or racing or doing something like that. It's almost guaranteed, in my opinion. Tracking the medicated horse. Well, you know, because these horses are not bred or raised as food, there's no way to document where these medications are coming from, where they've been exposed to these medications. If a dairy farmer has antibiotics in his or her milk, then the whole operation can get shut down until they figure out where it's coming from and what's going on. If a horse has antibiotics in its system, good luck identifying the horse, the source. These horses are coming from all over the country, from auctions out of, you know, all sorts of weird places. How would you ever be able to find out where this medication came from? So. The veterinarian's role has evolved over the years. I think veterinarians have a responsibility for the protection of animal health and their welfare and the prevention and relief of animal suffering. Even if, even if it affects their bottom lines, veterinarians need to behave like doctors whose priority is the health and welfare of animals. Thank you.